Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, appreciate everybody coming out this afternoon. Exciting time for us. We get an opportunity to uh, announce our coaching staff and also uh, timing worked out pretty good to announce that uh, we have restructured Michael Vick's deal and Michael will be back next season with us. Uh, so for us as a staff, getting, get, getting ready to move forward, um, putting together our plans offensively, defensively, and special teams, but knowing that we have Michael and Nick uh, back at quarterback, you know, kind of gives us a direction of which direction we're going in in terms of what we're going to do offensively. So uh, first off, I'll, I'll address the staffing of our, our group. Um, real important to me that, that we took our time with this. It's not something that you want to uh, just jump at the first person you meet, you know, and I, and I really wanted to make sure that I was very thorough in the whole process of uh, talked to a lot of different people, had input from a lot of different people, and then sat down and met with some outstanding coaches. And, and the biggest thing for me was who's the right fit for this organization and, and for us as a group, understanding the personalities, um, how I work, uh, how some of the people that I brought with me from Oregon are, and then how we put, fit those pieces together. But uh, I wanted a diverse group. I wanted a group that had a, had a lot of varied experiences in terms of where they were coming from because I thought that was the best way to go about it. And we've had some meetings so far as our staff got completed here and it's it's been great you know when you when you sit in a room and you get an opportunity to bounce ideas off of bill laser or bob mcnell or pat Shermer or jeff stout and the list goes on about who we've hired here um, we all come from different backgrounds and, and our our whole goal is to put together the best plan for the eagles in 2013 and, and that's what these guys have done um, that's what they've been charged to do and, and the best way i can describe what this staff is and why i think it's a, a great staff on how we compile this is that i think it's a great fit um, no one really has an ego. We all have the same goal, and the goal for us is to win, uh, not only win on the field next next season when we start, but to win today, and, and to come to work every day with a with an energy and an enthusiasm about how do, how do we take this thing to, to different spots, and that's what we're charged with. You know, how do we do it better than it's ever been done before? Um, we've got a group of guys that are really understand what that's all about. We've, we've had some great meetings. We finally got everybody in place uh, as of this weekend, so the first day we're, we're all really together is today, and so it's kind of fitting that we announce them all at the same time. So. With that, I know there's probably some individual questions about guys, whatever, so we'll, we'll open it up and see where you guys are. Chip, you just said, yeah. Chip, you just said that uh, you're excited about having Michael Vick and Nick Foles on the roster. Mm -hmm. next, so both of those guys are guaranteed to be with the team when on when the season opener? Or I hope so. In case one of them gets hurt between now and tomorrow. But, uh, you know, there's an open competition. Michael knows that. Nick knows that. You know, Nick knew every step of the way what we were doing. Um, I, I specifically wanted to make sure Nick was included in the plans. and. Um, I think I think both of them are outstanding qualities in terms of being quarterbacks in this league. Both of them have started in this league, so I also know in this league you better have two. So uh, I'm excited about the two of them, but they're, they're both going to compete. And who the starting quarterback is to, to start the season off is, is going to be one on the practice field. Okay. Uh, Chip, uh, most coaches when they assemble staff want to have guys that are kind of they work with before and they're on the same page with them. And you've kind of gone the other direction. How, how are you going to get the staff to, to actually work that way? Or do you, and yeah, I know you said you wanted uh, different opinions, but how do you get everybody on the same page by opening day? I, I think that's where the whole process took a little bit of time, is to make sure that um, I wanted people that had different opinions, different experiences in terms of what they could bring to the table. But I think when you meet these guys, you get a chance to sit down and visit with them. We all think alike, just because we didn't grow up in the same systems from a football standpoint, it doesn't mean we don't think alike. And I think that's the unique thing is us trying to put this together. And, and I, I'm not a guy, I want to be challenged. And I, I think we want to be challenged as a group. You, you want a guy to say, hey, we did it this way. And then it makes you think of a different way to do it. And it's, it's the ability to create what's the best identity for this football team moving forward, not this is how I did it at Oregon and this is how we're going to do it here. You know, that's not what I wanted. And I also think, you know, when you don't have people that have a lot of egos, and that know that we can learn from other people is what makes this whole collaboration going to work. Work, And that's the big thing for us, is that we as a group have to understand at the end of the day, it's about what's the best thing for this organization. And that was the big quality for me. How, how much energy do these people, how much energy do these guys have and how willing are they to work with other people? Um, some people are outstanding football coaches and have tremendous ideas, but they may not be the right fit for us. I think all of us understand that um, we don't have the game cornered. We don't have the game you know, and know it, this is the way it's got to be done, and please do it this way. It's, it's uh, let's let's put together an idea, and, and if we can't learn from each other, then, then that's shame on us, you know. Um, put a bunch of guys together that are coachable, and, and uh, I think it's unique in the profession that we are because probably the most uncoachable people in the world are coaches. We want our players to listen and to adapt all the time, but as coaches, we don't want to do that, you know. That's not the staff we put together. We put together some great minds 
very sharp, ton of energy, but they're willing to listen. And then at the end of the day, it's what we do as a group, and I think that collaborative effort is going to show up when we get on the field in 2013. Hey, Chip, back on the quarterback situation. Uh, I think a, one thing that a lot of people were really looking forward to here, that this was a fresh start with you, that things were, you know, that everything old was gone and the old problems were gone. Having Michael back seems, you know, people are thinking about his turnovers, his injuries. I'm sure you looked at those factors in making this decision. Uh, what was your thought process in, in Coming back with him, do you think he can still be an effective quarterback in the NFL, a starting quarterback? I really do. You know, and I, I think in terms of Michael, you, you, we looked at everything, but I look at his skill set first and foremost and what he can do and how he can throw the football, how he can beat people with his feet. There's a lot of different factors he has. And then you also have to look at what the landscape is out there for other quarterbacks. And, um, you know, the, 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 I guess the best way I can put this is uh, I agree with you in terms of that it, there is a change of scenery going on here, but for Michael Vick, there's a change of scenery, but not a change of address. Ed? Uh, hey. Ed, can you just introduce yourself, too? Yeah, sure. Hey, Chip, Ed Kratz with the Bucks County Carrier Times. I wanted, it's interesting on your staff, you hired a sports science coordinator. Can you just speak to that position and what exactly that, uh, you know, that job will entail? Yeah, the game of football has evolved, and I think we as coaches have to evolve with it into to always harken back to, well, we did it because that's the way it's always been done. I, I just never bought into that theory in my mind. You know, and I, I want to know why we do things and everything that we do, whether it's the athletic training room, the strength and conditioning room, to anything that touches this football team. And the only answer I won't accept is because we've always done it that way. You know, and it, it, if you look back just 50 years ago, people trained in football and they weren't allowed to have water during the game. You know, there was a bucket on the sideline and you had a ladle and you scooped it out, had a, had a sip, but if you drank water, you were soft. You know, obviously we've evolved from a science standpoint, and I think um, there's a lot of other sports that have evolved faster than football has evolved from a science standpoint. And we want to be on the cutting edge of that. Can I just ask a follow up to that? Sure. Uh, he has a military background. Is there, you know, there's been some talk, you know, when you were at Oregon, putting the guys through some sort of a military boot camp type stuff. I mean, is that what we can expect to see, uh, you know, as camps uh, start to gear up here going forward? Uh, I'm not going to have face paint on, I can tell you that. Um, now, I, just the fact that where, where Sean has been in, the, in recent years, he's also started off as a strength and conditioning coach at Nebraska, spent time at Nevada, has been at the collegiate ranks. I just think it, it's, a, it's a different experience that he brings to the table. Um, but are we planning to attack a foreign country? No. We, we have enough trouble with the 31 teams we got this league. So. Chip, Tim McManus from Philly Mag in 97.5. If there's a, an open competition at quarterback and Nick Foles maybe is more suited for a West Coast as opposed to, I don't know what the plans are with, with Michael Vick and possibly running more of a, a spread option, I mean, how would you do an open competition while having two different systems going yeah, back and forth? I, I don't think it's two different systems. You know, I, I think, again, people try to look at what we've done in the past and, and where I've been and kind of paint it with one brush and so because everybody wants to have a sound bite and say your offense is this you know I don't think what we do offensively it can be just said in one or two words that we're either this or we're this you know we're a, a equal opportunity scoring operation you know whether we run the ball over the goal line or throw the ball over the goal line it really doesn't bother me it's it's how do we move the football and, and uh, there's been games where we've had to throw it in our league 50 times there's been games where we have to run it 50 times I think you you need to be built for the long haul you know, and, and I think um, there's a skill set that Nick has that, that really excites me about him. You know, and I, I had the opportunity to see him up close and personal um, for three years, and I know what he can do. Um, and so I'm excited to work with him, and I think we've got an older quarterback in Michael, who's 32 now, and got a young, younger guy in Nick who's going into his second year, and I think it's the ideal situation for us moving forward this season. And Chip, Jeff McLean from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, okay, you mentioned that. Hey, you mentioned that you hope that uh, Nick and Michael will both be on the roster by the start of the season. Does that mean you're not ruling out a possible trade for either quarterback? We're not ruling out anything right now. I, I think our job, and we know from day one, is to to put the best, best team on the field when we open up the season on the, on uh, on September 13th or whatever day we open the season on. So, you know, they, we don't. I don't rule anything out. I don't rule anything in. But, but I know moving forward, we as an organization had to make a decision what we want to do with Michael. And I want Michael to be a part of this team. Real quickly, there's been a report that you have been eyeing or talking with Dennis Dixon. Um, is he going to come back? I mean, he's going to be reunited with, uh, with Dennis. I, I haven't. Last time I talked to Dennis Dixon was during the open date that whatever the Ravens had. He was. Uh, he came out to Oregon to watch us play. I can't remember who we played. But that's the last time I've talked to Dennis. So. Um, but anybody that we have the ability to 
to look at, and we're doing that right now. Our whole staff, uh, personnel, everybody's in, involved in free agency in terms of trying to upgrade our roster. And any opportunity we can to upgrade our roster, we will. So I haven't ruled anybody out of that either. Chip, Mark Narducci, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Could you tell me what went into your decision to pick Pat Shermer and how you two will work as far as the play calling will go? First off, on the play calling, I'll call all the good plays. Pat will call all the bad. <laughs> that, was, that was first and foremost. First question we had, so will you take all the credit for the bad plays? He said yes. We jumped right to the top of the list. Um, no, I, I made a real conscious decision moving from the college level to here that I wanted to hire coordinators that had NFL experience, and that was extremely important to me. And you know, I was pretty thorough in my investigation from that. And I think, you know, when Billy Davis and Pat Shermer and David Fipp, we got that. Um, and meeting with Pat, you know, to be honest with you, it was one of those: is this too good to be true? Because the longer our meeting kept going on, it was a two-day deal. When I met with Pat, was, you know, we, agree, we that's a great point, or we agree on that, or how do you see this, and what eyes are you seeing it through? And, and we just seemed to hit it off, you know, and it's. Uh, it was one of those deals when I looked at our assistants after Pat left, and I was like, you know, what do you guys think? And they, they were, we were all in the same, you know, and, and I was excited that um, Pat told me that in the bottom line is he just said, I said, where do you see yourself? And he said, I just want to win. And that's exactly what I want to do, and that's exactly what we want to do. Um, so that put us on the same page. But he's got a, the fact that he was here for 10 years as a quarterback coach, you know, was just kind of icing on the cake to me. You know, he, he has a great understanding of this building. I think the reputation he left when he left this building, when I mentioned the people in here that we were interviewing him, you, know, you could see their eyes light up. And, and after meeting him and, and spending time with him, I can see the reason why. And I, I think he's a great addition. I also had thought about it. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work out or it does work out to have a guy on staff who's been a head coach in this league. So uh, Pat's office is connected to mine. And I know the door's usually open because I, I walk in and say, Hey, what'd you do in this situation when you were a head coach? So um, there, there are so many just bonuses, aside from his football knowledge, which I, after meeting with him and getting on the board with him, which is just outstanding, just, uh, you know, his personality, his mindset, uh, it was kind of a slam dunk for me after getting a chance to sit down and visit with him. Chip, Matt Lombardo from 97.5 The Fanatic and opinion to the house.com. Uh, can you talk about the process with, with Billy Davis? Because you interviewed him, and obviously there was about 11 or 12 day gap before formally announcing him as a defensive coordinator. What went on during that time frame, and was there ever any wavering on either, either party's part? No, there wasn't. You know, for me, it was just being thorough. You know, and I, I think, I uh, can't remember exactly what day, it was one of those Sundays. So every day runs together for us because we've been here every day, but uh, that Billy came in and did an unbelievable job. You know, in, in uh, really sometimes when you, when you interview people, you know, it's sometimes it's, it's like you're pulling teeth, you're asking a question, you get a one-word answer, there's not a great rapport, there was a great rapport, and we just kept going over deep, different situations, different scenarios, and just talking football, you know, and it, it, it felt, you know, what I want our, our meeting rooms to feel like, because it wasn't an interview, it was just a bunch of guys talking football, and some real intelligent questions, some real intelligent answers, and um, I felt after interviewing them that, that he was the guy I wanted to work with, um, but I also knew, uh, instead of jumping at the first thing to make sure we had the opportunity to look around and, and i explained that to billy you know we're pretty transparent as a group is, is uh i thought you did an outstanding job i'd love to work with you but i wouldn't be doing my due diligence if i didn't get a chance to talk to some other people and, and i guess when i did talk to other people it just reaffirmed that billy was a guy and it, it was a you know a great you know just a great fit again and i know i keep saying great fit but that was the most important thing for me and putting anybody together here on the staff so Hey, uh, Ruben Frank, Comcast Sportsnet. Uh, you brought five guys who you had with you uh, on various levels at uh, in Eugene. You just talked about with those guys, Matt and Jerry and Eric, and those guys uh, kind of give you in that comfort level of having them appear with you now. Yeah, and, and that was really important to me to, to get a bunch of guys in here that understood me and really kind of built it from the bottom up, you know, and, and Eric Janander and, and Todd Light and Matt Harper and Greg Austin is, is guys that were um, our young coaches at Oregon that have been with me for a couple of years and understood how I want things done and what my vision was. I knew I was going to hire coordinators that were NFL guys um, that hadn't had the opportunity to work with me before. So, you know, when we had a meeting and, and um, I have a tendency to talk really fast, I do not like to meet very long. I want things to be really efficient, but I also know that I may forget to say something that Pat Shermer can go to Greg Austin and goes, what do you mean by that? Or the same thing with Dave Fipp with Matt Harper or the same thing with Eric Chenander and Todd Light you know, Phil and Billy Davison. So uh, for those young guys and building it from the ground up with them is that, 
Now I can put together guys that had NFL experience coming here, but those guys can kind of say, this is what coach means, this is how we operate. So, um, you know, kind of getting that fit that I talked about again, but it's, it's, uh, it was integral. Plus, I think those guys are outstanding coaches, and, and they're really going to be rising stars in this profession, and, and they're smart, they're intelligent. I don't have to worry about, you know, what time you're supposed to be in the office because we all kind of challenge each other and compete with each other to who can get in first in the morning and who can leave last. So. Um, you know, when you got to worry about guys that do a clock watch, and then you probably hired the wrong guys, and I didn't with those guys. So. Hi, Chet. Kevin Callahan from Courier Post in South Jersey. With Billy Davis's background, uh, are you going to be switching to the 3-4? And what would your thinking be behind that? Is it because of facing the 3-4 a lot in college? That's one of the things about Billy's background is Billy's versatility because he's coached in both. Um, what direction we end up ultimately heading in. Um, I liked the 3-4 better when I first started at Oregon. We weren't, I think from a special team standpoint, just philosophically, if you carry more linebackers on your roster than you do defensive linemen, you help your team from a special team standpoint. But, you know, you just can't do that in a day. You know, so it's um, it's a situation where we're evaluating all the personnel on our team and, and we'll see where, where we are. But I think anybody that runs a 3-4 defense has elements of being a four-down scheme, no matter what it is. It may not be on first and second down, but it could be on third down. So uh, one of the things that really attracted me to Billy was his versatility and, and being able to coach in both systems. You know, and, and he's been a 21-year veteran of this league and has coached under guys like Dick LeBeau, Bill Cowher, Wade Phillips, Dick Fangio, just spent time, you know, in Cleveland with um, Dick Geron. So he's got a varied background himself, and that's what I really wanted in a coordinator, a coordinator that had some versatility. Then it's our job as coaches to figure out what's the best game for the guys that we have in place. You know, everybody has a wish list on how they want to do things or what they want to do, but everything we do, both offensively and defensively and special teams wise, is always going to be driven by personnel. So, hi, Coach Paul Zolovitz from WIP Radio. Uh, you mentioned your coordinators had to have a mandate of NFL experience, and that their experience could help with the other guys you brought from your team and the like. Were the coordinators the only ones you required to have NFL experience? And what was your point of view on the whole staff as you went through looking at that? I, I, let me brief. I mean, I didn't require it, but it was uh, you know on my wish list how I want to do it, and so it it wasn't really a rule as much as it was a guideline as I was looking at people. So, um, but we we've got you know first off the, the two guys that were here before Deuce and Ted Williams. You know, you look at Ted when I first got the chance to sit down and visit with Ted, and um, you know just kind of struck by we all have an opportunity in our lives to to be around intelligent people. And I think that's important when you put together a staff. But I think more than being intelligent, when I met Ted is, is uh, Ted's got wisdom, Ted's wise. Ted's been here for a real long time. And, you know, just sitting with him and, and sharing some stories about, you know, how he approaches things and what his teaching approach was like. I was like, I, I just, I need Ted to stay, you know, and I want him to be a part of this because there's a lot of times I, I'm not going to have all the answers. and, and uh, I'll probably wear the carpet out between my office and Ted's office to ask him some certain scenarios because he's seen so much. Uh, in Deuce, I've got a guy that not only won a Super Bowl, but's been in Philadelphia, uh, tough, hard-nosed, intelligent. Uh, you're around Deuce for 20 seconds and you, you know a guy that just absolutely loves football. Um, so it was important to have that around. And then bringing in some of the other guys, Bobby Bicknell's got great experience. Again, a versatile coach. He's been an offensive line coach in this league, been a tight end coach in this league. He's coached the receivers most recently in Buffalo. So to bring Bick in, um, you know, brings another fresh, fresh ideas. And that's what it was about. But I also know for me personally, it was important to get guys that, that had NFL experience because, you know, that's the one thing I didn't have coming into this. So I, if I don't have it, I got a bunch of guys on staff that, that, that can help me out from that from experience standpoint. But it it wasn't a rule as much as it was more of a guideline just for me and kind of putting this thing together. So Chip, Derek Gunn from Comcast Sports Network. Um, you talked about why you brought in a sports science coordinator. What exactly does a sports science coordinator do? He'll assist Josh in the um, in the weight room, you know, our head strength conditioning coach in terms of implementing individual plans for our players, but also trying to stay on the cutting edge of uh, what the new technology out there, not only to monitor our players while they're working out, but recovery. Jeff, Jeff Mosher from Comcast Sports Net. Um, getting back to the 3 4, four 3 and the versatility, you have hired a, two different linebackers coaches and inside and outside, so it seems like you will do some variation or hybrid of a 3 4. Um, you said you're evaluating personnel. Do you feel like if you want to do something more natural 3 4 that you have, you can easily do that with the personnel you have now, or do you think it will take? radical roster change and in general do you feel like after some of your evaluations that there'll be a lot more roster turnover than what's typical of an NFL team? 
I just got here, so I don't know what's typical of an NFL team. So typical for me is we signed a guy today, so we made one roster maneuver. Um, but besides that, it's it's it, we really won't have a real good understanding of our guys until we have that first veteran mini camp in April, where we get a chance to kind of you know because a lot of times you'll see them on tape, you'll say, hey, I really like this, and then you'll see some guys in person and go, whoa, and I didn't know exactly what we had. You know, the beauty for us is this is February and we're not playing until September, so we've got some time, and I think we've got versatility in our coaching staff. Uh, and I think we have some versatility in our roster. I'm, I'm excited. You know, I, I think sometimes when you look at a team and you get an opportunity to come in, it's it's you know there's a there, there's a little bit of a hole in terms of a talent standpoint. I think there's talent on this football team on both sides of the ball, and it's our job to get them going in the right direction. Jim Marcus Hayes from the Philadelphia Daily News. There have been two offensive line coaches here with some of these offensive linemen with very distinctive coaching philosophies and styles. What did you, what is, how would you describe the style or philosophy of Jeff Stalin and, and why, why him, what, what drew you to, to Jeff? I think Jeff, real simply, is a creative, cutting edge offensive line, school, offensive line coach with old school toughness. You know, and I, I think when, when you meet Jeff and you get a chance to visit with him, he, he's extremely intelligent. Um, he has a way of making complex things very simple, um, but he also has an edge to him, you know. And I, and I think that's what I wanted when he, when you get a chance, and I know you guys will get a chance to visit those guys up, but um, afterwards, I, I think your old line coach got to be a tough guy, and I think your D line coach got to be a tough guy, and, and, and we hired two pretty tough guys on both sides of the football. Uh, Chip, Chip, Bob Drogue, Delaware County Daily Times. You had the fourth pick in the draft. Mm -hmm. Is that a spot? Where you could consider, you, you have an idea of what the quarterbacks are like from college. Is that a spot you might consider a quarterback, or is a quarterback could that be a consideration, say like early in the draft? Yeah, I'm I'm not a big hypothetical guy because, you know, I mean, I just have never been that way because I just would always take it to the next level and, you know. I just, I'm not a hypothetical guy, but what I know we're going to do with the fourth pick in the draft is make sure that we do the best thing for this organization. So. We got to evaluate the talent that's out there. You know, there's a process that our personnel department has. We've had draft meetings last week, and I just kind of sat in the back of the room as a fly on the wall and couldn't tell you how detailed they were. And really, really impressed with the reports that we got so far. And um, I'm sure we'll be on with all the information to, to do what is going to make us a better team come April. But you know, that's not something right now where we've even discussed like, well, what are we doing with the fourth? Because again, we have time. So you know, we're, we're still. Got a lot of time. Gonna, gonna get to the combine, get a chance to meet some guys individually, and then move forward. So, but I wouldn't rule anything out at this point in time. Chip, um, <clears throat> you mentioned the versatility of the staff, and how you're not done um, looking at, the, <laughs> you know, evaluating in terms of uh, your defensive scheme. But Bill Davis ran a scheme in Arizona last time he was defensive coordinator. It was called a four-three under, although it looked like a three-four. Um, I think the Seahawks do something similar. Is it, I mean, is it safe to say that that could be um, something that you would want to implement uh, because that's that would fill scheme in Arizona? Sure. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know until we get all the pieces in place. You know, we're, we're, what we're going to do is put our guys in the best position for them to make plays. And I don't know if that's being a 3 4 team, a 4 3 team, a 5 2 team, a 6 1 team. I know there's seven guys up there, so we can add up all the numbers to see how it is. But we're also not caught up in that. It's, it's not about how do we identify what we're doing. It's about making sure that we're playing sound defense first, second, and third down. And we could look drastically different on first and second down than we are on third down. But that's, again, entirely going to be personnel driven for us. So could it be a, a 4 3 under defense? Yeah, it could be a 4 3 under defense. Or it could be a 3 4 under defense, depending on how we want to get. I, I'm just not caught up with labels because I think. I don't think it's a it's going to be a label defense. You know, I think it's hopefully it's going to be a defense that creates a lot of turnovers and, and uh, gets the ball back to our offense so that we can be productive on the offensive side of the ball. And real quick, were you waiting for um, one of the Super Bowl teams um, to finish so you could interview one of the candidates, uh, one of the assistants there to become the defensive coordinator? Was I waiting for that? No. And you didn't request to interview any of those coaches? We made a request for somebody, but we weren't waiting for that. I was just trying to see what what, what was the best possible scenario out there. So. But I knew when I met Billy who I wanted to hire, and it was just making sure that I looked at everything before we decided on who we were going to hire. You were declined by the team? We got declined by the team, yeah. Was it in downtown? What's that? No. What? Ted, Ted, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Coach, Mark Farr is at a Sports Radio 94 WIP. Uh, if you look at Billy Davis's track record just as a defensive coordinator, he certainly had his struggles. What is it about this fit here that makes it that makes you think he'll have more success? Uh, 
meet them. You guys will make that determination. You'll understand why I hire them. Um, I think sometimes coaches get labeled, you know, you have no idea really what goes on, you know, and sometimes it's, it's kind of like being the quarterback. His quarterback gets uh, probably too much credit, too much blame, and it's the same thing for the defense coordinator, too much credit, too much blame, you know. I, I know when I talk to him, and I, in, in terms of him being a teacher and understanding the game of football, he's outstanding, you know, and, and then it's our job as a group, you know, to, to make a collaborative effort that, that we put the best look out there on the field. But everybody is involved in it, you know, and I think the one thing I love about this game is it's the quintessential team game, and everybody has a hand in it, you know, and everybody from the personnel department to the president of this operation to Jeffrey to Howie to everybody, our coaching staff, our players, everybody. So, you know, when you win and lose a game and you just single out one person, it kind of goes against the whole tenet of what the game's all about. If, it, if it's a quintessential team game, we're going to win as a team, we're going to lose as a team, and no one's going to shoulder that blame more than somebody else. But I think the important thing is um, he's an outstanding teacher. Uh, he, he's got some really, really, really good ideas, uh, and I'm excited to get going with him. Chris Murray, uh, Chris Murray, Philadelphia Sunday Sunday, the Chris Murray Report. You say you evaluate defensive personnel and all that. You say you like some of what you saw. What are some things of the defense that you didn't like? What are some where are some priorities in terms of position that you that, that, that you may need to look at, or is that still yet to be determined? We're still in the process. That we have finalized our uh, all of our evaluations. Um, but when I, when I met, I look you know I look at some guys and, and, and there's there's some good young talent there that, that excites you. You know, so the cupboards aren't certainly on bare, but do we need to continue to, to bring in some more players to help us? Yeah, it, it, certainly. You know, that, there's no question about that. But, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about do, do we have talent here, there's talent on this roster right now. You know, but do, we'll always, every single day, when we get up, try to figure out how do we make that even better and how do we add to that. Not right now, no. There will be, you know, as we start to formulate where we're going, you know, obviously with free agency starting here in March and then the draft starting in April, then we start, we got to start prioritizing at that point in time. But today in February, there's not a, we haven't set a priority that's we're still in that, still in that process of the full evaluation, so. Yeah, Chip, it's uh, John Marks from the Oregonian. What was the guidelines you whoa, had? Whoa, whoa. I'm from here. Oh, you are? <laughs> it threw me for a loop. Okay. Uh, I thought it was a geography test. <laughs> what were the guidelines you had in terms of picking your coaches uh, from there? Who you could take, who you couldn't, and how did that work? I, I didn't have any guidelines. You know, um, uh, when I talked to Rob Mullins, um, you know, he he uh, he was great. You know, and I think if, if anybody had an opportunity to what they felt was um, you know better themselves, I think that was, that was the kind of the key to that. But I also, um, you know, the one thing about Oregon that, that makes it such a special place is there's so many of those coaches on that staff that have been there for such a long, long time that. Um, you know, a lot of those guys weren't leaving. You know, the head coach changes, but the assistants don't. That's what makes that place so special. So, um, you know, I've known Ads for a long time. He's an East Coast guy. He was the only full-time coach I brought with me. And then all the young guys, it was just an opportunity for them to grow as coaches. So, what is it about Ads that you like? What does he bring? To the it, again, he's a lot like Jeff Stalin in my description of Jeff. I think he's a cutting-edge thinker with old-school toughness. Uh, he's. He's a lot smarter than he lets people on to, so don't let him bite you when, when you guys interview him a little bit later on. Uh, just extremely sharp, uh, got a great vision. Uh, we're on the same page 99.99% of the time. We, we think alike. Um, and when you when you sit down and talk with him, he's, he's an extremely, think, extremely thought out, deep, deep, deep thinker. And he's, uh, you know, he's a guy that, that when, you, when you visit with him, and you kind of peel back the layers and don't let them bite you. That uh, he's a pretty special person to be around. Chip, Jared, and Cameron of 975 Kinetic. When you saw LaShawn's tweets and then, of course, afterwards talking with him, um, does it concern you about character, um, the mindset behind that, and what it may or may not represent as a leader of the team? Yeah, I talked to LaShawn about that. and. and uh, you know, I think with any time I have a meeting with one of my partners, I think that's private between myself and LaShawn. You know, I think uh, it has to be that way or, or you're never going to be able to have a meeting with a player. But I also caution him, just like I caution everybody on this team, of, of what goes on in social media. You know, and I think sometimes people think a conversation is going on between two people, but the whole wide world is watching. So um, I believe our job as coaches is to educate our guys, um, you know, and help them out. But, you know, I've met with LaShawn and we, we had a discussion about it, but I'll leave that between myself and LaShawn. Hi, Chip. Les Bowen from the Philadelphia Daily News. When you talked to Michael Vick uh, uh, over these last few weeks, 
Uh, you, you indicated to us that this would be a competition. Has Michael indicated that he'd be willing to stay here if he were not the starting quarterback? Yeah, he didn't give me any indication except he wanted to be here. You know, in my meetings with Michael, I met with him twice. Actually, the third time was today because he stopped up after he signed his contract. Was um, just I had never met him before, so you know I didn't have any preconceived notions of what he's about, what he's not about, and just really talk to me about your life, talk to me where you're coming from, talk to me about your mindset. And I, I the one thing that attracted me to Michael after visiting with him, um, he's a competitor, and I, I don't think Michael's afraid of anything. And I think he wants competition. Uh, and I've seen Nick Foles up close and personal. I think Nick wants it too. So I think anybody, you know, when you really look at it, in, in uh, probably the most competitive position on the field is the quarterback spot. So you want guys that want to compete. You know, I don't think anybody, if you ask them whether you're on one of the other 31 franchises in this league, that you want something handed to you. No one wants anything handed to you. Um, and that's that's one of the things that stuck out to me when I met with Michael about his his competitive nature. So Sammy, we're down to three more. We're down to three more. Hey, Chip, Tim McManus, I, I read in one of uh, your coaching clinics about the, what you value in a quarterback and how you, you'd like that QB to get the ball out of his hand. Well, you were at the clinic? No, I've read it. Uh, it's, it's, it's online. For, uh, the, just caution is sometimes, and not, not the guys in this room, but sometimes things are written down may not exactly be true. But. Okay, maybe this isn't, but okay. it, it says that uh, you like the quarterback to get the ball out of his hands very quickly, 1.5 seconds, that every sack is on a quarterback. Those type of things don't exactly speak to the Michael Vick that's been in, in the NFL, at least up until this point. He's he's going to be 33 years old when he takes the field next. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, balance those two things? Or do you think you can kind of change who he is or, and what, or what he's been? Well, number one, I think when you look at his age and, and when you really study it for quarterbacks, I don't know if people know this, is he's, he's actually younger than Tony Romo. And he's all right about the same age as Eli Manning. You know, I think sometimes when you look at him, because he's been in the league for a while and because he came out early from college, you know, you look at his his uh, his age and say, boy, he's aging. And, and it's funny, and the only reason I say that is I mentioned that to Michael this morning, and he didn't know that. You know, I think uh, Romo was born in, in April and Michael was born in June and Eli was born in January, so they're right around the similar ages. So I, I think there's a lot more um, to Michael. You know, and I think quarterbacks um, are a byproduct of their experience. but. Uh, to sit here and say I understood the system that's Michael's been in, whether he's been the Falcons under Coach Reeves or, or here in terms of what they asked him to do, um, that depends on the system that you run. So some systems that they run don't ask him to get the ball out quick. Do I think he can get the ball out quick? I think he's got an unbelievable release. You know, I think it's it, it, it's up and out and it's it's quick. Um, what he's asked to do from a read progression and all those other things, um, I don't know what he was asked to do in the, in the past, but that's our job as coaches to put him in a situation where he can get the ball out quickly because we do have some playmakers on the offensive side of the ball that are going to flourish when we get the ball in their hands. So that's on us as coaches. That's A lot of times that's not on the quarterbacks. So. Just following up on that, uh, we were Frank Comcast Sports then. What did you see? How did you evaluate, Michael? What did you look at to, to be confident that this was a guy you wanted around here next year? I looked at the films, you know, and just studying the tape, not worried about what the – the, the line call was or the protection was or what they were doing, but you know the velocity on the football, how quick does it get out of his hands? Um, and, and one of the things that when you look at Michael is, is his toughness, and, and that can't be overrated at all at the quarterback spot, is to be able to stand in there and deliver a football when a rush is coming. You know, I think sometimes, obviously, the quarterback does get a lot, um, a lot, a lot credit or discredit for what goes on out there, but if, if somebody misses a block up front, there's a three technique running clean, and you don't flinch and you still deliver the ball, or you throw the ball and it hits the receivers in the hands and it's tipped and it's an interception, that goes down to the quarterback as an interception, but it, sometimes it's not the quarterback's fault. So really evaluating the tape, and when Pat Shermer was evaluating the tape, we were looking at him as we were really looking at his skill set. Um, I, I think he still has a skill set. I think he can still throw the football. I still think he has a quick release. Um, and obviously we know he can take off and run when necessary. Just following up on that, when you have your first mini camp, who's going to start out with the ones? Who's You'll go team? off of better than <laughs> So it makes your start. What's that? By last name. First name, last name, right. or flip coin. <laughs> we get enough reps in practice where no one's ever going to say, hey, I didn't get enough reps. So, you know, that's a, uh, that's another thing that, that we do from a practice standpoint is, is uh, we'll, we'll be able to share that load. So, you know. so you anticipate that both working with the first offense? Uh, yeah, start that I day. do. Can you bring us up to speed on the recovery of Jason Peters and when you expect him to be 100%? I, I talked to Jason on the phone just like everybody else, but I don't know. I haven't got into any specifics injury-wise, all that. Every every guy that's not here that I spoke to on the phone was just, hey, how you doing, introducing myself when you get to town. 
love to have you stop by, but I haven't sat down and visited um, specifically on where he is. I, I, I've, from our talks with the people in this program, he's doing well, but I haven't got a chance to lay eyes on or make any impressions on that. So. The intention, though, is that he'll be a starting left tackle. Uh, he'll be in a competition at left tackle. <laughs>